Good morning and welcome to worship at the First Congregational United Church of Christ in Hendersonville, North Carolina. Today is the fifth Sunday in Lent and I am delighted that you have decided to be with us in virtual worship. Let's take a moment now to center our hearts and minds for worship. Holy One, grant us your centering spirit Infuse us with your peace. Open our ears and our hearts and our hands to the movement of your word. Amen. Come and let us be in worship together. The contemporary reading today is The Anointing at Bethany by Malcolm Geit. Come close with Mary, Martha, Lazarus. So close the candles stir with their soft breath and kindle heart and soul to flame within us. Lit by these mysteries of life and death. For beauty now begins the final movement in quietness and intimate encounter. The alabaster jar of precious ointment is broken open for the world's true lover. The whole room richly fills to feast the senses with all the yearning such a fragrance brings. The heart is mourning, but the spirit dances here at the very center of all things, here at the meeting place of love and loss, we all foresee and see beyond the cross. The scripture reading is John 12, one through eight. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? 
He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put in it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. What do you have that is precious? Our recent move was an opportunity for us to decide what is precious. And then also it was an opportunity to clear out, give away, and make decisions about what was not so precious. Lots of questions and discerning that I know many of you have had to deal with in downsizing from large homes to smaller homes. Do you save those multiple banker boxes of old photo albums, high school and college yearbooks, term papers, report cards from third grade, and hundreds of swimming medals taking up acres in your spare closet? What do you do with Aunt Florence's clown collection or great uncle Albert's bow tie collection? Will your kids or nieces or nephews want these? What will be precious to them? I have my stepfather's cufflinks that have little tiny bowling pins on him, on them, and his bowling shirt. He was so proud of being on a bowling team that won state and regional championships back in the day. Although I will say by the time he was my stepdad, he had stopped bowling. In our kitchen, we have an old bottle opener that advertises Mrs. Asa Thurston's Dairy, which was Liz's grandmother's business in the 30s. No matter what our decor, wherever we live, it will match. It's precious. It's priceless. Every gospel has a story of a tender anointing of Jesus with precious oil. In all of the stories, Jesus is anointed by a woman who kneels at his feet, soaks them with fragrant oil, touches them with her open hands, wipes them with the strands of her hair. In all four of the stories, she breaks open a jar of expensive perfume worth a whole year's of wages. And it has to be used up because it can't be capped off. It is a one-time use vessel, that alabaster jar. In all of the stories, someone takes umbrage at the wastefulness of this action. And while all four stories are somewhat similar, there are different details and settings in each one to suit the theology of each gospel writer. Our reading today from John finds us in Bethany at a dinner party at the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, who are siblings and close, close friends of Jesus. From the beginning, the text reminds us of the juxtaposition of life and death, past, present, and future. Lazarus was dead, if you remember, and Jesus had resurrected him. And while she might not know it, we know as the readers that Jesus' own death and resurrection is pending. This dinner is so intimate and I don't know about you, but I feel invited into the scene that Mark just read so I can be fully present to the smoky scent of the nard, the sweet face of Jesus as he relaxes into the sensual intimacy of someone not just washing dust off his dirty feet, but massaging them with tender care. I want to bear witness to the eye raising of others as they look on at Mary and give ear to the judgmental rebuke of Judas. And I wonder at the affirmation of Jesus to Mary's scandalous, 
wasteful act of compassionate care. Mary embodies her love for Jesus. And in the Mediterranean world, love had the underlying meaning of being attached to a group, a family, a kin. In addition, in the first century, there was no term for an internal state, as in love, that did not require a corresponding outward action. When, Jesus, when Mary anoints Jesus, she is saying to him, you are my village, you are my kin. Theologian Debbie Thomas describes this beautifully. What happens between Jesus and Mary in this narrative happens skin to skin. Mary doesn't need to use words. Her yearning, her worship, her gratitude, and her love are enacted wholly through her body just as Jesus later breaks bread with the disciples Mary breaks open the jar in her hands allowing its contents to pour freely over Jesus feet and just as Jesus later washes his disciples feet to demonstrate what radical love looks like Mary expresses her love with her hands and her hair and just as Jesus later offers up his broken body for the healing of all, Mary offers up a costly breaking in order to demonstrate love for her Lord. And Jesus receives Mary's gift into his own body with gratitude, tenderness, pleasure, and blessing. The holy sacraments here are skin, salt, sweat, and tears. The instruments of worship are perfumed feet and unbound hair. I wonder what does that mean for us, being embodied? Because we live in a culture that doesn't treat bodies as precious, do we? And especially as we age, we become more aware of the limits and flaws of our bodies, bemoaning that we can't move the way we used to. And then there are all the wrinkles and the thin skin that tears the creaks in our joints. Our hips and our knees break down. And we start to resent our bodies more than cherishing them as temples of the holy. What if we looked at our aging muscles as good and faithful servants? And what if we dared to see our flesh and bones as sacred vehicles for love, hospitality, grace? Look at your hands. Hold them out. Trace the lines on your palms, the crooked lumps of your knuckles, those faded scars. Think of what your hands have held. Fresh babies, Thanksgiving turkeys, flutes of champagne at weddings, wet dirt squirming with worms, bags of trash, and the people, the hundreds of hands you have shaken, the multiple shoulders you have hugged. Think of all the ways in which your hands have expressed love, wonder, fear, offering, giving, taking, and sensual pleasure. They have been sources of worship. These hands of yours are precious. They have the power to break bread and bless, shake up and stir trouble and crack open jars of extravagant offerings to remind others that they are precious, they are treasure, they are kin. Several years ago, I was studying with a group of, group of clergy women on the island of Iona in Scotland. In that mystical backdrop, we considered all four stories of the anointing woman. One interesting thought that came up was how Mary and all of the anointing women were so completely given over to their act of love. 
Compelled by what I would say is the spirit of God, each woman poured out the most precious thing she had to care for what and who she perceived as God's promise to the world and anoints that promise, making it holy. And by doing so, she did cause a bit of a stir, stir a bit of trouble. Jesus welcomes this extravagant act in every story and even remarks that the woman who anointed him would not be invisible. Her boldness would be remembered. And you know, you can't be invisible if you are causing a little bold trouble. At the end of our time together, we were asked to reflect on who we identified with in the story. I have to confess that as I realized where my place was at the dinner party, I began to weep quietly. I found myself identifying more with those who wanted to hold back the precious nard. I had this image of hoarding tight my alabaster jar of richness and beauty, the nard that God has given me to pour out onto the living of my life in this world. You see, we all have an alabaster jar that we have been gifted with, a precious heirloom within us that can be put on a shelf in our soul, be saved for later, or be used for whatever is safe or expected. What is your alabaster jar? One thing is clear. There might be times when you are nudged or compelled even to take whatever that jar is filled with and break it open, pour it out extravagantly with abandon to create a stir or even a little bit of trouble to anoint that which is holy in this world, to bless that which needs blessing, to mark what is chosen and merciful and true. In this suffering and confusing world in which God loves, we are called to serve with all of what we are and who we are and what we hold as precious. Amen. And so as you go out into this day, don't hoard that alabaster jar. Hold it proudly and be aware of the places where God wants you to break it open, to anoint and bless all of those whom you meet. And remember, as you go on your way, to be kinder than necessary because everyone you meet is suffering with something. So walk simply, love generously, and leave the rest. Amen. Thank you.